a start. So welcome, guys, to Series 3, Episode 3. So it's a short series based on racing families. Uh, we obviously had the Corston family last week. The w week before that, we had uh, the De Kock family. Um, so pretty famous racing names. But you won't find many more famous racing names than Sangster. So we have Adam Sangster from Swettenham Stud. Welcome along, Adam. Thank you, Corey, and thank you for all your watchers and listeners. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And so, as, as we said, obviously a nice little photo there of you down there on the bottom right, uh, Adam, and we've got your father there with the Queen. So, you know, rubbing shoulders with some pretty impressive people along the way. But I guess the background, um, the things, uh, I guess it's best to get you to give us the background, I think, more so than read straight from the, <laughs> from the rap sheet. Uh, uh, where did it all start? Uh, well, basically, it started from my father, obviously, uh, Robert Sangster, who um, he was, we were born, well, I was born in Liverpool, but he was also born in Liverpool, and so was his, his, his father, and set up uh, Vernon's Pools, which were the original sort of um, betting, uh, before betting shops came out, was uh, betting on the soccer, soccer pools. So he set up, a, a grandfather sort of set up a, about 100 lotteries around the world, and we had the first... Uh, lottery down here in australia funny enough we had it with uh, uh murdoch and packer and sangster in the early 70s but uh, my father was an old only son and he sort of got uh, you know when the beatles were happening and sort of all down there in the cavern down in liverpool he sort of was uh, he sort of got, drove, drove an open top car lived where all the soccer players live now for liverpool well, it's the united nations down there and the Wirral at uh, uh, at liverpool just uh, in mersey there and uh, so he spread his wings and he was very much involved in in national hunt and he got involved in the jumpers there through eric cousins and it was through an introduction through his best friend uh, who actually wrote the, the horse trader with my father, uh, Patrick Robinson, and it was really Nick Robinson who introduced him to, to uh, John Magna and, well, really to Vincent O'Brien in the early 70s. And that's where they really took on sort of the, the might of, of really a lot of the broodmares, a lot of the stallions had been sold out of, out of Europe and had gone to North America. And there was this little stallion, or not so little in, in stature he was, but uh, had a heart and that was Northern Dancer and they identified uh, uh, my father and his team and identified Northern Dancer and his progeny and they went to the Keeneland sales back in the sort of the late 70s early 80s and purchased uh, uh, the younger stallions I mean that was really what it was the average share the average um, the average yielding price was I think about 50,000 and by the time the Arabs came into it in various ways through Sheikh Mohammed Sheikh Hamdan and Prince Khalid Abdullah because they found oil in the late 70s and got a taste of racing and because it was mixing with queens and queens and that's what they wanted to do they stepped into the arena as well so really my father and uh, and uh, Dr O'Brien and John Magna pushed for yielding prices from 50,000 to, to to a crazy amount Corey of uh, half a million dollars average and uh, and they even ended up paying a year for a yearling of 13.2 million or 14.1 million dollars uh in 1985 so it started from there my father has really sort of um loved his racing his royal blue and emerald green uh sleeves of uh, white cap and green spots been sort of recognized around the world he's bred or uh, uh, raced over 200 group one winners around the world uh, he's had winners in 22 different countries so this is as a family now so we've obviously taken taken that on uh, my father sadly passed away in 2004, but uh, he certainly left legacy and something very strong. And, uh, you know, we've had some fantastic horses through the time. He enjoyed breeding. Uh, Sadler's Wells was his, uh, his probably his, uh, his greatest achievement, but uh, loved Australia, Corey. Had a great fun here. Loved it so much. He married us the second time around. He married a lovely Australian and, uh, and uh, you know, he won the cup in the 1980 and, and some great friends. And um, I was lucky enough to, to be introduced to Australia in, uh, in my, in uh, when I was 18 and never looked back really. It's um, pretty comprehensive. That's probably a little bit there, of a Adam. snapshot. You've, you've, you've <laughs> probably, you've probably covered all my questions in, in, in one there. Um, but I guess <laughs> what, what was it, um, what was it that took, 
uh, took your father firstly to horses, I guess. Obviously, you mentioned the pools and lotto business, but what was the draw of the horses? What, what, really, what really caught him and captured him like it captures everybody else? I think it was fun of internationalization as well. Uh, I mean, air travel was becoming very, very popular around the world, and he was traveling to Australia a lot, and he saw what racing was like down here in Australia. And uh, really, he he was a, he was a numbers man, and uh, uh, and he enjoyed he enjoyed that side of it. And he just recognised an opportunity where really to to syndicate stallions, and it had just been the time really when you could only serve 40 mares with a stallion so it was it was unheard of and then back in the sort of uh well up to about 1970 70, i think 17 70 uh, 80, 81 82 i think uh be my guess who was at coolmore i think uh, john magna killed what he did covered 97 mares and it was so frowned upon and now you see what the figures which we're doing now but it's really 40 40 shares uh, and and you could only serve 40 mares and of course, someone like Norman Dancer, he was standing at a million US. So just let me put that to you and your listeners in, pers in perspective to show you what the numbers are in these horses. Is that with, you probably all have seen that great movie, The Queen, The Bohemian Rhapsody. Now there's a scene in it when Queen comes in at Wembley, which actually I was at in 1984 for the um, uh, Save the World. And they punched out that song and Freddie Mercury got on. Now in the background you had, uh, yeah, you had the ticker going around of trying to raise a million dollars, a million pounds for that, uh, that, uh, that event. Now it ticked over to a million, a million pounds. Now my father was against, uh, was in America at the time and they bought a yearling for 13.1 million. So it just shows you where the industry was over there to where the, where, where the world was. I mean, certainly in charities and things where it had come along and it's come a long way. So this, this really, this industry has, the, you can see the figures that were, uh, are, well, they are enormous, but at that stage, they were enormous. And, and really what they recognized was taking the blood out of America, bringing it back to Europe, and then selling the stallion, making mini stallions. And they had to put a pretty significant outlay early doors when they first went into bat in, in Keeneland in Kentucky. And, uh, and they needed winners and thank God they had a, a lovely, he wasn't a big colt, but he was called the minstrel. And uh, he, was, uh, he was a lovely chestnut horse who basically got up in the derby, won a short head and they managed to syndicate that horse for 15, 20 million. And at the same time, a ledge was purchased and a ledge was by Hoist the Flag, who was, uh, he was only, a, I think he was a $127,000 ready to run horse because they have the breeze ups over there in North America. And he won, he was trained by Vincent O'Brien and he won the ARC in 77 and also the ARC in, in 78 with Lester Piggott on board. And he was syndicated back to America for, uh, I think it was 25 million. So that's really, that's where their game plan was. And then, you know, it was, it was taking it on from there and taking on some of these stallions where Stormbird, they had Stormbird and Stormbird produced uh, um, st uh, st uh, 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 Stormcat. And then, of course, there was Sadler's Wells, who basically was the, uh, you know, he's, he, I think he had 2,225 folds and he started his covering, his, his lowest he ever was, was uh, 150,000 uh, pounds. So the figures, figures were extraordinary and that's where they went in. But obviously hurdles along the way of uh, competition, which is all, always fresh, and a few wives along the way, which, uh, divert, which, which cut the pie up yeah, a little bit. He... But uh, you know, <laughs> we all enjoyed it. And I guess, um, I guess the, I mean, it's very famous the the battles that he had with the with the Sheikh Muhammad and 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 those types of things, which and the prices, as you said, just went through the roof. But that led to what's called the summit in the desert, or or folklore has it as the the summit in the desert. Can you explain sort of what went on with with that uh, and and how that came about and what that did to the industry? Yes, well. The long, uh, basically, the average was so strong in Kentucky, and Sheikh Mohammed has, uh, had just uh, the, the Dubai, well, Dubai doesn't actually produce oil, but the, the Emirates had found produced oil, and of course, Dubai being a great port, uh, they uh, that's where uh, Sheikh Mohammed, now obviously the ruler, and with his brother Sheikh Hamdan, and that's where they made their money. So they stepped in into the market and started pushing up these prices and also don't forget that uh, uh, america was very strong as well there's some very strong oil uh, oil men in america which was uh, uh, dean wayne lucas who was a great trainer over there who, who was uh, strong in the in the sales at that point 
And basically, the long and short of it was that uh, um, really going to these crazy prices, there are certain cults by Northern Dance which each, each, each team uh, wanted. So they sort of, you know, a gentleman's agreement. It was a toss of a coin. Um, you take lot 35, I'll take lot 42, you take lot four. And, you know, we, uh, father missed out on a few nice horses, one being Sharif Dancer, who won the Derby, and he was a $3.2 million yearling at the time, which Sheikh Mohammed had. But uh, they just got to a point where it was, it was silly just bidding against each other. And the Americans, I mean, I, went to, I was lucky enough to go to a couple of these parties in Kentucky when I was 18, 19, 20 years old. And no joke, Corey, they had big tops in these middle of Kentucky with elephants and balloons going around. I mean, never forget, uh, Bob Hope was actually the, uh, he was the M of C, um, master of ceremonies, uh, belting out, and Sammy Davis Jr. was punching, you know, was, was, was on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the piano. And uh, you, know, you could see cross-legged on the ground was sort of Stavros Niarchos because there was only sort of, you know, the most, most influential Greek ship built, ship, ship, shipping magnet in the world. You know, no, no sitting room, no standing room, just, just kneeling room. So, I mean, it was, and they really did go, they, they, they knew these guys were appearing. Uh, every year, these, you know, they'd, they'd fly by Concord to new, uh, uh, JFK and then three planes would arrive at Bluegrass, Kentucky with Sangster, uh, Sheikh Mohammed, and then in the, uh, in the third one would be Prince Caleb and his team. And they go to battle, and this was crazy. So um, really long and short, they got together. But, but America had got greedy, and, uh, and they over-egged it. And uh, they'd gone, and they'd really sort of borrowed a lot of money where you could do that. And that's when the penny, you know, the, when the pound stopped or the dollar stopped. And because they'd over, sort of uh, over-egged themselves, they sort of, um, they, 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 um, uh, they said eighty five percent of the farms had a for sale sign outside the door, so it was a very time when it was just brought back to a bit of reality yeah, and I guess that, uh, that was going to lead me to my next point. I guess growing up with that as an eighteen year old where you see all of that you know wealth in horses and the numbers were you know astronomical is is it a little bit um hard to come back to reality and and come back to the normal i guess now where those numbers are lower or, or does it just find a middle ground where this is the normality now as opposed to the normality then? I uh, figures that I mean for myself personally I was lucky enough because I, I got dropped off, dropped off at school at six years old and was picked up when I was 18 so we we're at boarding school for basically for for uh, nine months a year and it's various holidays you didn't really see what was going on uh, and that sort of thing so I had a very grand because my parents were divorced had a very good mother who kept us very grounded indeed uh those figures yeah they 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 i mean it's everything typical everything rise and fall you know it's uh, it's it's uh, you see the heady times i mean it's it's uh, well, the last one was you know probably 2007 8 before shears and lehman had a the, the the trouble with mortgage prime rates in america but then we had nathan tickler step into the market and you know Nathan, for all, all the things he did bad, he actually supported our market uh, pretty strongly. And, you know, when everywhere else was going around, around the world, I think in 2008, uh, I think it dropped about 3%, uh, or 2007 dropped 3%, 2008 dropped 4%, and then, uh, and then it did have a bit of a correction of about 20%. But Nathan did hold that up. And, uh, and you know, we could have gone a lot further and a lot worse. But, of course, that market, you know, like our recession, we, you know, what was our recession here? We only went into four weeks in it wasn't it during COVID, but we haven't been in recession for 28 years. So here in Australia. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly like anything. Uh, and I feel the market will do this a little bit next year. It's uh, the market will be, uh, it will be focused on top and, uh, you know, the syndication of horses as well has come into the market. And I believe the syndication of horses, unlike 20 years ago, when, uh, a trainer would get from from uh, from people who've raced horses with that trainer said, go and buy me three or four horses. That doesn't happen anymore. People have now got the excuse, or not the excuse, just the way of spreading out their risk. And now through syndication, when you you, you could buy 10%, now you can buy 5%, or now you can come into a partnership of of, of 20 of you with 5%. So it's it's people just want elitist, and and that's where you know that's where I feel the market is probably probably it's going to suffer a little bit, sadly, lower and, and middle market, which has done. But of course, as we well know, a lot of those good horses come from that, uh, uh, that middle market and lower market, not just the top end. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting times.
Yeah, and during COVID, the market has has stayed quite strong. It has been that middle market that's been affected. But I guess we go on now to setting up in Australia and obviously strong, deep roots with Coolmore. And I, I can see with some of the stallions that you stand at the moment that obviously there must still be a great relationship there. Yeah, there's, there is a very strong relationship. Tom Magner, who runs the Australian op operation, and I have been, you know, we've grown up together. And, uh, but it really goes back to that uh, initial times, I think in uh, 74, when father and, uh, you know, he was over in Ireland. And of course, these Stalins, when you started to do the bigger books, and because of air travel, and more importantly, the veterinary side of things and the welfare of these horses were, were, were so much more sort of, uh, um, so much more uh, apparent. And it was, it was just all in focus on the welfare of these horses. That, but really, you could actually fly these horses because a lot of horses were flying to, to, to America to race in the big, big races over there. As we had down here in Australia, you had Balmerino going up to race in, and Strawberry Road to go and race in the, in the, in the, uh, the Arc de Triomphe, you know, 70, 78 and 79. And uh, so with that, these stallions in the off season, of course, the breeding season in North, the Northern Hemisphere is just, say, Valentine's Day to, uh, to, 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 to June, early July. And, of course, yeah, with air travel and quarantine and regulations, and, of course, Australia being an island, very strict quarantine and regulations, but these stallions were allowed to be brought into here, and that is when the shuttle business started to happen. And the first two through a relationship, which my father had with the Hayes family, which we still do, but with Lindsay Park, uh, quite a few of those. I mean, Lindsay Park in the 80s in South Australia, uh, I'd say it'd be 82, 83, was, was the, the, the number one breeding ground in Australia. It wasn't the Hunter Valley, it wasn't Victoria, it was South Australia. So it's, um, you know, through that, a lot of these stallions came through and then Coolmore obviously saw the thirst for it and got bigger. And we were in partnership with the land, which is Coolmore now, and which Arrowfield did take on until after Danehill. And that would have been around about, uh, yeah, I think it was, ooh, Actually, no, he died in 2003, so it would have been, uh, it would have been probably, yeah, probably 94, 95, when uh, the big bidding war went on between uh, uh, Arrowfield and, and Coolmore and, uh, to purchase Danehill. And that's really what set Coolmore into the bigger, the higher, higher areas. And of course, Danehill was recognised down in Australia before he was recognised in the Northern Hemisphere. I mean, I stood a stallion in the Northern, uh, from the Northern Hemisphere, Danehill Dancer, at Colin Grove, which was the, um, the, the, the hybrid of uh, Sangster and Hayes got together because we stood Rory's Jester. And when Colin won the 1985 uh, Golden Slip of Rory's Jester, he saw what the stock looked like. And he went and said, listen, Dad, Robert, you need to buy the stallion. So they went up to the Hunter Valley and this gentleman called Syrian Vanian was, was standing them at a property called, I it just escapes me now. But uh, he said, listen, if you want the stallion, you've got to buy the property. So we bought, bought uh, that property, which we called Colin Grove, and we bought Rory's Jester. But of course, he became champion top sire because he's very prolific uh, um, thorough or precocious horses and, and very strong horses. So when the Vobis scheme set up in 94, that is when Swetner moved down here to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Victoria. And with that, we stood, we were still standing horses like Danehill Dancer, like uh, uh, Scenic, also, um, we had Bluebird and Marju, Celtic Swing. We had a lot of very, very good, uh, you know, Celtic Swing who produced Takeover Target. So, you know, there was a strong alliance with Coolmore, but when Coolmore really did decide to, 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 uh, to plant their flag here, uh, that's when we then sort of uh, had to source of stallions from elsewhere. And that's really, you know, it was when David Hayes, he was racing up in Hong Kong and when his father passed away in 1999, and sadly his brother passed away in 2004, tragically, David was going to come back. But he, when he did come back, he didn't want to breed at Lindsay Park. And because he had the share in Colin Grove, I bought him out of that share in Colin Grove. And subsequently, when my father passed away, my family, we drew a line in the sand, nothing sinister. And I made Australia my home. And uh, you know, I still speak to my brothers uh, every, every once a week. So it's, uh, it's, it was... It was um, that's really how the timeline came about. Yep. And has it always been Australia for you? Do you is this home now? Do you, is this, you know, are you, do you see yourself oh, yeah, I became, Australian? I became a, yeah, you know, I am Australian. I became Australian in 2006. And uh, I was actually, with, yes, on Australia Day, it was the MRC phoned me up and said, listen, we've got Peter McGoran, who is Minister for uh, um, uh, Agriculture, 
culture at the time. He said, he's going to come and do the ceremony and we'd like you to, because we see you, you're up for, um, for, to be naturalized. So I said, oh, great. I said, not, not just that, but even better, we've got a Danehill filly out of Isca. And Isca won the Newmarket in the, uh, and uh, uh, what well, she won the Newmarket, what was the other one? She another one of those group, great group ones, I think maybe the Oakley Pate. But, um, and uh, anyway, so it was her first foal. And McAvoy, who was training it, Tony, because David was in Hong Kong and Peter sadly passed away, uh, said, listen, I'll, I'll win this race the third race there on Australia now. I said, great, because I'm going to be naturalized. So I'll tell them that. It'd be a great ceremony, a great story. Anyway, it was the first time they had had a full start. Uh, and it was, an ob it was an optical illusion. Funny enough, it was a Rory Shestercolt, baldy face, who looked like he'd fallen out of the stalls. And the stall had opened a little bit earlier. And, uh, and it wasn't. It was what it was doing. It's a transition from VHS into digital. And VHS was 28 frames per second. Uh, the L style uh, and digital is 42 frames per second. And of course, they're all four inches apart. So the race was won. We won it by four lengths. Stephen King on board and was breeder, 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 second, third and fourth. And she was then going to go straight into the blue diamond. She was called Lang Ness. And, um, and uh, the long and short of it was we were giving all the money to the tsunami because that's when uh, sadly on December the 26th, the tsunami hit uh, uh, Aicha and, uh, and all the money was going there. But uh, but uh, yes, I got naturalized then and it was 45 minutes delay. And I would never forget what my father would have said if he was alive. He would have said, Adam, it's like being bowled out LBW and you're taking the ball back home. So we basically, we, we accepted it because, uh, which was fine and, uh, and moved on. But uh, yes, I've been an Australian and I'm very proud of it. It's fa fantastic. And we're lucky to have you here. And obviously we move on now to mm -hmm. your current operation and that's a pretty impressive list of stallions that you have here now. So, so I guess one of the questions on the last slide there was, what is the process of standing a stallion? So uh, in terms of identifying a future stallion, acquiring it, and then setting the price points, what, what, what's the process in doing that? You, you, yeah, you're right. There's, there's probably f the four Ps. Um, there's the physical, there's the, the presence, the pedigree and performance. Um, oh, well, present, sorry, there's physical, which is presence, is pedigree and performance. And then the fourth one is obviously price. So ticking all those boxes, and, but the competition is very fierce. And, you know, it's, it, there's obviously a lot of, lot of uh, there's a few standards out there which you do identify, and especially for Bolivia uh, and in the Southern Hemisphere, um, you, you sort of chase after that, but they are highly sought after. And, um, and so you've just got to box very tightly. And a lot of this is building up. You can, you can, it's very hard to start uh, an industry, in an industry of standards like this because a lot of it is the relationships you have with, uh, with the farms and the bigger entities you know, to make sure that uh, you, know, it's, you, you can have a lifestyle. I mean, I'm not a man who wants to get there in a hurry, and nor is Swetnam. But with relationships which we had with, uh, with uh, various operations, we can, we can do that. But you can, you can blow a lot of money from, uh, from, from trying to buy all the stallions and, uh, uh, well, not buy, buy a few stallions, which may not work. And then you've got to back it up the following year and back it up with the mares to go to those horses. So really with our roster, which we've got, I mean, I've always wanted a son of uh, High Chaparral. In fact, my breeders here in Victoria said they didn't want the High Chaparral in 2004 or five. Um, and I've still got the list of people who said no, uh, the whole list. And, um, and uh, so to get a son of High Chaparral in Toronado, and these, the Alsha Cab for, out of Qatar were the new big entities and uh, had a strong relationship with, uh, with, uh, with uh, the French and, uh, and with John Warren, who was basically the, the Queen's representative. And uh, through that and him standing at the English National Stud, which my brother Ben was chairman at, we managed to get Toronado. But as you know, Toronado has got amazing muscle definition and he's got two year old speed. And that is what's proving down here. Now, the other stallion you've got there is, uh, is Highland Real. And I think with Tom Magna, when he saw Highland Real, you know, and what Toronado had done down here, we, we got the numbers to him. He said, how about this? And I said, listen, it's, and he was more than happy to stand him at the figure he wanted to, which was 16.5, uh, uh, 16 and a half thousand. Now we were actually bidding on Corey, a uh, son of Snitzel at the time. He was only a group three winner, you know, and, and basically for what we were going to pay for him, we were going to be standing him at 16, point, at 16 and a half thousand as well. Now here you have the son of Galileo out of one of the best families in, in, the, in the Australian stud book. Um, and who won seven group ones and placed in a number of other, other group, 
group ones and massive amount of group twos, still Bally Dawes, most, most, um, most, uh, um, most prize, prize money only of over 15 million, 15 million. And yet these two, these two standards win a stand similar to each other. <laughs> and it, yeah. it just makes, just the way the market is, makes it, makes it, makes it, makes it a mockery of it a little bit. So, um, I mean, Highland Reel this year in his third year is going to serve more mares than he did in his first year. Uh, of 150, he served his 150th mayor about a week ago. So the market really likes those, uh, the progeny of those. There's four in the Magic Millions, four Colts, nice Colts. Funny enough, one of your last people who you spoke on this program, Henry Field, he bought one and I think he paid 75, 78, 78,000, but that's being re represented at the Magic Millions. The Classic's got four in it, Magic, um, New Zealand's got a few in, and obviously in Victoria there's a, there's a good amount in, in that. But yeah. uh, um, then, obviously, then we've got Puissance de Lune. And Puissance has come from, you know, in October last year, he had 22 mayors booked to him. And then you had the uh, uh, Edward Manifold Day at, at, uh, at, uh, um, at uh, Flemington. And it was as if he started the season with 300 mayors. I mean, he served 152 mayors. And we were served, I mean, it was a mayor, which is, we are just looking at too, served on the 31st of December. So with owner breeders, you can do that. Now, these stallions, Harlem Real and Toronado, which you've highlighted there. Now, Toronado goes back, well, Highland Reel goes back on the, uh, the 7th of December and, and Toronado goes back on to France on the 16th. So, um, so really, pre this year, we rose his pr price. I mean, Jerry said, uh, Jerry, you know, Jerry Ryan, who owns the horse, he, uh, the stallion, he was very good. He had uh, offers from, uh, from uh, Arafield and from uh, another significant outfit. And he said, no, I'm Victorian, so stay, leave him here. So he's, you know, he, he served his, he was a full book. He served his, uh, I mean, you'll see probably about 160, 170, and hopefully he'll get, uh, you know, he'll, have, this is his biggest, well, last year's crop was pretty strong, but this year's crop is, is pretty good. Then we had to get a son, because last year we stood a son of Scat Daddy, uh, a speed horse, the market wanted it. We had 90 mares booked into him for our stallion parade, Sioux Nation, and, uh, and he was a group two winning, uh, Royal Ascot winner, group one winning two-year-old. Uh, breeders came and had a look at him and they said no we don't want it we don't we don't like him and uh, you know we only serve 50 mares with him which a number of mine and a few client mares now the market did that with Knight of Thunder Knight of Thunder is now standing at 150,000 euros and you talk to people when he was pulled out at Dali and people's side and you know uh, sometimes uh, my brother said it to me he said it to me it was very good he said if you look it goes back to those performance if you like the performance like the pedigree and uh, and you like the physical, you know. Don't go and look at the stallion. You're already you're already convinced. <laughs> You'll be yeah. put off if you go up there because he may not he physically look what you're wanting. And that's happened with so many horses we've had down here. Invincible Spirit, you know, he was similar to that sort of thing. So, so we had to get a son of uh, of, uh, of that line because I'm, my next door neighbour, Mr. Rick Jamison, says that that is a line which is going to be very strong. So, of course, when Dream Thoroughbreds and they were up here yesterday looking at uh, I'm Immortal, and he just was a an ideal horse out of a Ad Valorum mare, who was a stakes winning mare. And that was out of a Fazlid mare, fastest two-year-old of his generation. It was out of a warning mare, fastest two-year-old of his generation. So that's speed all the way through. And he'd won the, won the lead-up race, two lead-up races for Blue Diamond. And he was just, a, he just was wanting. He would, he would serve as 130 since, he, since we announced him. And we got some very strong, good shareholders into him. Uh, another three or four sons of... Uh, uh, Invincible Spirit and, uh, uh, and Vinny came into, into Victoria. So my, my team, Sam Matthews, has done a very good job and good, good shareholder support from him. And then Trustin McGust, I mean, he just, he sadly just had the rotten start to his Stalin career. Uh, he really did. And it's just a very unfortunate way, way he went because he was, he was, uh, he was uh, going up to, to abort him to him and he was favourite for the Doom and 10,000, favourite for Stradbrook. He was flying up to leaving from Tullamarine, uh, midnight flight for the, uh, for the race on Saturday. It was on the Thursday, midnight, and he was being pulled out to the, uh, to, in a container with two guys on either side in fluoros, and he tried to jump out of the container, and he ripped all his underside. And then oh. Alfred Cab phoned me up and said, you know, I was standing Toronado, uh, uh, Prison Stallone, and Trust in the Gus. And then they phoned me up and said, listen, we've got the son of Star Spangled Banner called the Wow Signal, who was won the group one as a two-year-old and was favorite for guineas, just broken down. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll take him and let the racing public enjoy racing 
uh, and watching Trust and August. And, uh, and then he didn't, never came back to his form, but he was drawn wide barriers. And then we had a disaster on the for farm, which I won't go into. And he just never really started his good stud career because it just, just didn't get numbers to him. And uh, he, he served more numbers in his second and more numbers in the third year. And you saw what Tradewind did on Saturday. And yeah. Ricky, and as you know, I mean, you've told me this, but uh, old Robbie Griffiths has got a very nice one, which came third, first time out and missed the yeah. start and rattled, rattled home. So, uh, and I sent four up to Queensland to be again trained up there and three of them sadly died on the way. So um, it's, it's, he's just been a, been a sad sad uh, um, he could have been a lot better than where he is and it's a bloody good time to go to him mm. there's a, and there's a, a, you're That's only one race one good race two good races like you said away from from people jumping back on though and we do jump on and off stallions very quickly as Henry mentioned when we had him on we've had James Price on the same thing um, but Australians love to jump on and off stallions very quickly. So why do you think that is, Adam? Do you think it's, you know, we're not a very patient nation, that type of thing? <laughs> yeah, I think it's all, it's globally. It just me, it is globally. I mean, it was uh, the, the, the said stallion that uh, Night of Thunder, I mean, my brother Ben was staying with one of the big guys at Dali in, um, in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, in England. And the guy came back after this December sales and, Look, shattered. He said, "What are you shattered?" He said, "I've had to turn away so many people for Night of Thunder, and we've had the same with Tornado. And people just, uh, you know, it's very hard to to do that. It's harder than actually letting. It. It's a very good position to be in, but uh, certainly, you know, it's the uh, it's it's the uh, um, the trend is your friend until it bends, my friend." <laughs> and uh, so I had um, Genevieve has just commented saying, you know, so many stallions that you would love to visit. And, and that's not just with Swettenham across the country right now. There's some fantastic sires. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't have, have, the, have mares and, you know, might not be in the breeding game yet, but would love to be involved. But also when they go to the sales, you know, when, when, when you first go to the sale, and that's how these webinars started, when we first, you know, the idea was to educate people when they first go to the sale what to look for and what matches to look for so i guess you know what do you see as some magic crosses here i've heard simon vivian tells me that the highland reels on the ground are, are fantastic um so you know what makes a good click or you know what makes a good match to to a stallion exactly so i mean we all know bloodlines but what exactly is it what are you looking for that stands out to you uh, well, probably a nick which works, which is he would have been sort of suggesting the Galileo over Danehill, and uh, you know this, the trends you follow the trends, and there you know there's some great uh, great outfits out there. I mean, uh, 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 Group One Gold Mine. I mean, there's these uh, these uh, I've taken this on. This is a it's it's now evolved G1. I think G1 Gold Mine, not Group. Uh, that's now evolved into a serious sort of intellectual property there, where you can have a look through it. We really get you know it's. Um, Funny enough, I mean, uh, generally, my uh, my father, his PP Hogan, not the uh, not the um, uh, Sir Patrick in New Zealand, he used to look at the horses. He was the backstop for my father, uh, and when Dr. Vincent O'Brien used to give the list, uh, whichever sale it was, PP would look at it. Now PP was very much a an Irishman. He couldn't read and he couldn't write, and he was master of the hounds in Ireland. And he would go and he'd be give the last call and just basically cross one or two off the list or. Or, or and give the final list to my father and uh and so really the best judgment is really to to find someone who who does do this who are with the horses all the time and you know you you pay them for the services if you're not there it's a full commitment to do it constantly if you think you can do it on your own good luck and it's the best way in racing to make money is to lose money to start off with and then you can make some money but uh it's uh and breeding because it's uh but surround yourself with very good advice which my father did and which i do make sure you've got great advice great people on there because that's even if you're paying them a little commission or or however it is putting up with them or enjoying enjoying their company you you you, you will get it back in dividends because it's uh it's uh if, if it's so many facets of it all and so many different ones that really, you know, it's an industry where you definitely let someone else hold your hand and go through it as long as you can afford it. But it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful industry. It's a wonderful lifestyle. And certainly English is magic millions. And through Oz Horse and through Re Breeders Victoria, I mean, they do a very good job to introduce people into the industry, to have special seminar days, 
to bring people out to the sales to go through go through the horses if it's not with Ma Eustace it could be with uh, with with there are always people each day and, and Troy Corsons is an absolute sort of a you know he, he he's a benchmark for it all so it's uh, there are people there to do it but uh, you know you just just uh, you know, and nowadays you can go in there with, a, with, with just um, not a huge amount of money. You don't need a huge amount of money. I mean, if you're standing at Christ, we can go to bars now, we can go to a restaurant, you can go to a cafe. If you're standing having a coffee in the morning on Friday morning and you say to someone, I've got a runner tomorrow, you wouldn't believe it. I've got a runner. If it's a stall, if it's a Mooney Valley, they'll never say, actually, Genevieve, how much do you own of it? So, yeah, the object is just enjoy yourself, get out there and have some fun because it, it's life changing. Yeah, and I, I mean, like we, I'll go back to when we started the webinars, and as you know, um, I started it just to educate myself because there's no real formal education process that you can go through as a, you know, if you're interested in the, in the industry, and quite often you kind of need to be born into horses to to get the education process or go out and muck out boxes and things like that when you're a kid. Um, so what I've found with a lot of the followers on the webinar is getting all of the professionals on each week it's just the learning and the information they get along the way has been basically the comments every week are that they they got so much out of it but just before we go to the main questions adam we've got a speed round coming up but how's akid mafid going because i do have a bit of a soft spot for dabawi and i'm just interested in how 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 he's going in your opinion I'm glad you mentioned him. Uh, sorry, because I did. I did. Uh, I didn't. Now, uh, and I mentioned Night of Thunder a lot because he was he being by Dubai. We, I mean, the sun's Dubai. We stands at two hundred fifty thousand euros, but down here you can get the blood now through Akid Mafid. He, I've got to say, he's he served a very strong book last year of one hundred and thirty. This year, it's a little bit of a shame because what happened was when uh, Mr. Pan, who owns the horse, he owned Lindsay Park. He took three or four of his main sort of uh, um, main main group horses up to Hong Kong. Dougie White, great jockey, great um, great man, and good friend, got his trainer's license, and he rode a Keith Mafid for Mr. Pan. So when he came down here last year with Richard Gibson, who also trained a Keith Mafid, they they hijacked quite a number of his horses to go up to Hong Kong. So he just he's going through that process where. He's, uh, he's really, he's got two-year-olds at the moment. They were a bigger crop, better amount, but of course uh, the foals on the ground are a, a lot better. But uh, he just has been one of those ones which just, uh, it's a shame because you need horses to be running uh, for you. And uh, as you know, they are, they're, 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 they're good. But that blood is you know, significant. Mm. Yep. All right, the speed round. So this one is always interesting. So what we do, <laughs> so we'll ask you a question. It's the first answer that pops into your head. So no time to think and a 30 second answer if you can fit it into 30 seconds, but it's, it's quick, you know, we rapid fire. And then for all of those people watching um, it, in the Q and A button down the bottom, I noticed that there's a few questions come through in the chat, but if you could pop it in the, in the Q and A button, that just makes it a little bit easier for myself to, to read. Uh, and then I can get those to Adam towards the end. So we're ready to go. Favorite horse. I'll try. Be, I'll try. Be ver I'll be very. I'll be very quick with this. This. This one. Favorite horse of all time. I guess. Favorite all horse right. of all time. Probably Red Rum. Stallion that you would uh, love to stand. A, yeah, National Hunt. So uh, stallion that I'd love to stand. American Thorough. Which of your current stallions excites you the most? Uh, Highland Reel. Uh, how often will we see the Sengster colours in the winning circle? Uh, getting getting stronger. Not a man in a hurry, but getting certainly getting stronger. Cox Plate or the Everest? Cox Plate. Is that because of tradition? Yeah, absolutely. I think you right. know, it's, uh, it's an entire when the Cox Plate... Uh, the um no it's come second isn't it uh yeah this year wasn't it there was a there's an entire who came second wasn't it so dragon is uh, an entire isn't it he? he is he is but he like yeah he's lovely lovely horse great pedigree love soft ground uh dinner with any current horse personality in the world who do you choose now you've had some good ones in the past but who would you choose now yeah that's that is good i would probably choose someone from 
Hong Kong. Um, uh, yeah, someone from Hong Kong, someone from, uh, uh, in, yeah, no, I'd say it's, yeah, David Revers, he's, he's pretty, pretty good. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's always, always Frankie Dottori is always a great, great personality. Um, I think he, I think that's, that's spot on. Obviously, uh, we have, uh, some good relationships with a lot of people. So, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, it's the fun. owner, the owner of, of American Pharoah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe get the owner yeah. and you could <laughs> a few wines. You might be able uh, to stand him. Um, st stallion it, had, the stallion that you had the most faith in, in your career, but let you down. Um, Yes, uh, most faith in let me down. Probably master of design. Uh, which master moderately, design, yeah, no. which moderately priced side do you think will boom next? I think Cable Bay is going to be a good one. Yeah, got one of those with Robbie, so that I hope you're right. Not good. So, and he's an entire, so if he wins a few races, we can send him up to you. That would that would work quite well. So, favourite sport outside horse racing? Uh, fly fishing. And the best advice you could give for potential owners coming in? Be patient. Be patient. And the bonus question is, when, when do you think people will be able to return to the farms? And would your host uh, tell me how webinar followers up there to, to have a parade? <laughs> Uh, I like it. What we'll do, what we do, we'll, we will, of course, we'll do do that. that uh, but we sort of aim, certainly through this this year, what we've done is uh, obviously with COVID, it's uh, the farm has ticked on very strongly. So we'll we'll focus on stallion parades and, and times. So Corey, of course, we will do that. But it's probably going to be when all the stallions get here, uh, which is going to be late August. And I think uh, I think by the looks of where the first of September the season starts. So if you just go back to this. The Sunday before that, um, that's when the Stalin Parade will be. And, you know, the whole region, I mean, is, is just exploding here in the Gambia. I mean, we've got uh, not just the Gambia, but around the surrounding area, what's happening, uh, you know, with the, with the microbreweries, Mitchell and Winery, Harvest Home in Avenal. You've got, uh, you've got some great eateries around and some great places to come and stay. So we're only an hour and a half out of town. So, yeah, it's, uh, uh, take your time and come up here. It's an interesting story, actually, Adam, how we met and how I got you onto the webinar. <laughs> and now, so we're actually um, basically went up with my father-in-law to visit one of my horses um, at Mags and Luke's farm uh, at Maluka Thoroughbreds. Then we went across to Woodside Park, and but we were running a bit low on fuel. So that, that famous petrol station, because we also went to the same fuel station by chance to buy a horse with Troy. <laughs> the only reason we went to look at the horse that we bought was because <laughs> we went to that and Troy said we may as well stop at Woodside at the time. Um, but yeah, I ran into none other than yourself, Adam, at the fuel station and my father-in-law happened to recognise you and we got chatting and here we are. Hey, yeah, no, it's great stuff. That was a no, great meeting that. I'll certainly remember that as the only meeting I had in COVID. <laughs> yeah, with a mask on as well he did very well it helped that you were wearing a sweat and a hoodie uh, so so daniel guthrie asked a question here which stallion does adam think will be sweating them studs next superstar because he would like to buy a share while they're still affordable <laughs> uh well it's, you know it's uh I mean, Torinado, he's he's very strong. Prescience to Loon can't, can't with both those horses you can't buy shares in. Um, I'm Immortal is probably the the one which is uh, is is viable. I mean, he's son of you know the, you know the story on him. He looks amazing. I mean, when he came to us in April, and I try to get the Stanley's here in April because we've had it in the past where a Stanley's arrived a little bit later in his career and maybe just raced it up in Brisbane or or and come in, come to us, and they just don't let down. When a stallion lets down, the muscles do it, and they become real sort of a, a bull of a horse, and it's important, and breeders like to see that. And every time you parade one, 
and this is when you talk about parades, sometimes the stallions actually think they're going out to races and they're going out to the tracks. They actually never let down that well. But someone like I'm Immortal absolutely let down like a true professional. And he just, uh, he, he, he's, he, you should go back onto, I think onto the Sweatnam Instagram and you'll see the before and after shot. And this is only two months before. So he's one which one, uh, one uh, one combined two and uh, you know the other ones the other trust you no know, it's uh i'd if you're out there looking for for shares i mean strasburg he's a nice horse to buy into you know he's of anthony Mithens, you know uh he's he's a nice horse and probably um you know there's uh there's uh no those 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 people they try hard yeah and henry field actually mentioned you know, there's a lot more tradable commodities now. So it may not be that you have a share in the stallion. You might buy breeding rights or you might buy, um, you know, different types of things which you can now use as tradable commodities, which in the past has probably not been the case. Um, so, and is that becoming more and more prevalent? Absolutely. Let's do that a little bit more now as well. It is. It is. Uh, there's a subtle difference between breeding rights and shares. Shares, you get you get a share of the overs. Uh, and when I say of the overs, if there are 40 shares and uh, you each get a, a service for that, those 40 shares, then the stud gates are uh, between 15 and 20 for their services and a few couple for marketing. And anything over on top of that comes back into the pool. While breeding rights, you just get the chance to serve that, uh, that mare and you don't get any, any of the breeding rights. Uh, you don't actually own any of that share, so you don't get any of the overs. And there's great deals which, uh, you know, secure, um, which, which Spendthrift do. I mean, they bought in a hybrid uh, one there, and, you know, that's, that's, that's a not, not a bad deal. They've got some nice horses there, so it's, uh, it's good. And these are new long across the river here. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to be an entity to be really reckoned with. I mean, they've got 10 Stellings boxes here at, uh, at their operation at, uh, at Negambi here, and they've got, uh, obviously, we've got uh, Alabama Express and Grunt, but, uh, you know, we've got another eight, another eight boxes. So, you know, they're going to be a, uh, a very big force to be reckoned with and uh, good people to deal with. Yeah. And, and how, did it, how does it actually work with making a deal? So you mentioned I'm Immortal, which obviously was owned by um, Dream Thoroughbreds, I, I imagine. And then, so how, did, how did, uh, we don't want you to give us all the inside uh, information for obvious reasons, but how does the basis of it, work in terms of the well, owner i'm more than happy to do, more than happy to do that i mean he he basically was a stallion who cost 1.4 1.4 million we then uh sold shares at 1.6 um mm -hmm. really you've got to you we, i think it was 44,000, including gst you got one nom in the first year two noms in the second year two noms in the third year uh nominations or two services but also if you came in the first year and you had a second mayor you could then send send another um another mayor to, to him at a, a, a discounted rate now where the two hundred thousand sort of fits in on top of that you've got to have insurance fertility insurance is basically it's six percent of the value of the stallion and then you have mortality insurance on top of that which is two percent so really the, the insurance policy only lasts for the first uh 15 mares covered and if they've got a very closely covered that they've got to be a fertile mare they've got to be a young mare and they've got to be a mayor which is, uh, uh, has got, uh, well, obviously an early, 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 early service there, got a good, good history. Now, the insurance companies will tick those off because there have been a number of stallions who have gone, who have died this year or last year. And of course, insurance premiums start to go up. And when that goes up, that's when uh, those horses start to, um, start to sort of, that's when the premiums start to uh, um, uh, go up a little bit. So we basically, we, we, we put them into 40 shares and, um, and we got some very strong, good shareholders from around, around, um, around uh, Victoria and, and certainly New South Wales and a couple in New Zealand yeah. and South would, Australia. Would it be fair to say for new, new people coming into the breeding industry, the, the best way to go first would be to buy a few mares and things like that. And uh, before they, they started to look at going into shares in a stallion as such, or, or would you say, you know, the options there to go straight in? Stallions are, stallion shares are great to get involved in, but you really, the farms don't really allow you to, to, to buy shares unless you are, uh, you can't be a passive investor. Uh, because they do actually, they they do actually to um, they they uh, they're great for your super as a sophisticated investor. 
uh, and as long as you can show that, but really to, to appreciate that, then you've got to have a mayor which goes to that stone. So, so there's some great benefits in that and you can and tax write-offs for it. But really most studs don't allow someone just to sit there and do nothing uh, and just, just watch the dividend come in. Uh, you've got to be really proactive in that. And uh, really what's come through this as well, Corey, through this, um, this, this where we've been in lockdown, the online markets and the online sales uh, have been enormous. And certainly for that, up to sort of $50,000 and obviously, uh, obviously further. I mean, you saw that mayor who produced uh, Shelby Cobra the other day, who was uh, just produced a Toronado filly uh, the day before she went on the market. Uh, fill it and she sold for 325,000. I mean, yeah, I mean, online, I mean, incredible. Uh, so it's, 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 it's all set into a lot of people I've, I've met new people coming into the industry like to do things on their own because a successful business lady or businessmen themselves and they can, they go and they screen the Englishes and now magic millions have come onto the, uh, the digital platform as well, which is interesting for Jerry Harvey having not done it with Harvey Norman. So <laughs> you go through those and the, the mayor or the progeny or, or the bloodstock you're buying doesn't have to move off the property. So we could have a mayor here and someone says, listen, I'm, I want to move her on. We put her online. We put a very good picture of her up there. She doesn't have to move. So the welfare, and it's all about welfare at the moment in the industry, or we've got to look after these horses, look after not just horses, but people involved in it. And this is ideal. So you don't have to take the mayor stressful out of her own environment, down to the sales, stand in the sales, and you may have a mayor in the first quarter of a, of a catalogue and one in the last quarter of a catalogue. So staff also get disrupted from their families. And this online sales is ideal. So it's, it's, it's a good, good phenomenon. And a lot of people have actually dabbled in that and taken advice from, you know, taken advice from, I mean, my Sam Matthews. I mean, he, he, is, he, he, he is so independent uh, about, about what advice he gives. He just wants people to make sure that they're, they're, they have enjoyable time and we'll come back again. And we don't push our own horses. Uh, we, if, they, if they match up with, with another, standings, uh, another standing in the country, we'll certainly push that way. Yep, fantastic. And I think it's a common, common thread. It's such an intricate business that we could speak to you all night, I'm sure, but I'll run through some of the questions that are coming through. So Russell Batch says, what is Adam's thoughts on the amount of promising Aussie horses being sold to Hong Kong? Do you see that as a bad thing for Australian racing? Well, that's a good question, Russell. Uh, we have been a little bit of a guilty of that, uh, not guilty, but uh, detriment to us. I mean, not only Akiva Mafid, but also Toronado. I mean, seven very good colts who should have been racing down here have been taken up to Hong Kong to race. But as David Hayes said, when he went up to Hong Kong, I mean, he and I were up in Hong Kong together. I was working as a, as a, in the finance market for four years up there from 88 to 91, uh, 91, 92. And David came up there and he said it was a different time nowadays being living up there. He said there it was very much European and English rule, obviously. And then the hand back in 97 and mainland China is very strong in the market. So they, the, what the Hong Kong Jockey Club is with, with uh, uh, Kung Fa and uh, what they've done in mainland China, that's going to get stronger. So I think it's uh, as they don't breed horses up there, uh, it's, it's it, the hardest thing, Russell, is to get through the, the very strict um, very strict indeed uh the um x-ray so if you get offered for a horse from hong kong and the figure is enormous don't go and spend it until it passes the x-ray because a lot of them fail uh and a question from genevieve again do you offer full shares uh we did do funny enough people have done quite a good good deal with full shares full shares we did do with uh with puissance de lune and uh and of course you know we did it two years ago and uh a number of people who who uh, clients who went to went to uh, puissance turned a full share into 50 60 70 100 thousand dollars in fact so on turned it into 120 thousand dollars because of what puissance did do and they had a re relation to one of those which uh which uh, certainly hit the racetrack running last year so yeah, we do we don't do them with the with uh, uh with a number of them with a number of the stallions uh if they're up and going but certainly ones at uh, middle market we would do yeah and i mean just before i go on to some of the other questions there are in my experiences generally if you ring uh call somebody like yourself and and ask a question it's a 
it's a it's a yes no it's quite quite simple can you do it can you not do it would you say to to the people viewing if they do have a question on you know how they might get involved at the price point that they actually can afford to give you a call and ask the question um would that be the best way to go for for most of them in any of the breeding industry yeah, any I, of the studs I, yeah, we do. I mean, all the studs, I mean, the one thing about the Australian stud zone down here is that you can actually pick up the phone and get th straight through to the principal. Uh, while there's a not, lot of farms who you, you can't do that because uh, a, it's a language barrier or B, they're just, uh, you know, you've got to go through uh, uh, one, uh, one person after another after another to get to that person and probably wouldn't, wouldn't get to it. But down here, we pride ourselves being an Australian farm, investing in Australia and employing a lot of uh, a lot of Australians at the same time. So, yes, by by all means, do that. Um, it's something which uh, send send us an email, and then we'll we will. If I can't answer it, which I probably won't, won't be able to do it in an email, I'll certainly give you a call. Yeah, I, I did a bit of work when I was in the UK uh, in my own industry in uh, football or soccer here, but football, uh, and I was work doing a little bit of work with the uh, with Middlesbrough in the community and and even as staff members at a big club it was impossible to get you know to get to chat to the the manager or the first team players so it's an amazing industry here that we actually have access to the top trainers the top breeders look by picking up the oh, phone yeah. essentially it is and especially down here in australia i never forget my father when he was based in based in the isle of man and uh and his his are quite senior people now in the industry globally, and he was wondering why he would never get any any deals come through to him. Uh, and and uh, it was only when people actually wrote to him by mail in the Isle of Man, and he'd do the deals without telling the others because he got so knocked off with with them not with them saying no, Robert won't like to do this, this and that. So you know there is I think Australia is a place where. Uh, you can, if you don't know the person, uh, one phone call and you can get to the person who will be able to do that. And we're very open here because we realize that, uh, you know, certainly the trainers and the breeders and, and all, I mean, uh, Oz Horse is a, is a phenomenal sort of operation and that takes a little bit of a, uh, you know, that's, that's really their charter is to, to, to introduce the Australian racehorse, certainly domestic, but also promoting it around the world. So do have a look at that website and also the Thoroughbred Breeders of Australia website and the Thoroughbred Breeders of Victoria website because there's a lot of information on there which and and the the bodies there the people that you'll see the directors and the and the committee people they will very happily feel feel the call and if it's a, if you go through those ones genevieve and you have a look and you sort of see see that it's a spendthrift horse you want to have a look at gary cuddy you give gary cuddy a call and it's uh, cuts to the chase from there so so do um you know um yeah do do some research as well on the people you want to talk to and i've got a question here from uh pat McLaughlin, he says, if Sioux Nation progeny proved to be popular here and overseas, would you jump back in and get him back? Or has the market here already told you that that's not worth it? So I guess, you know, if a stallion goes elsewhere, is there a possibility to bring it back? It's a bloody good question, that. Um, you know, we, the crazy thing about Sioux Nation is that he served 241 mares in his first season in Ireland and uh, we only managed to serve 54 down here and in his second season in Ireland gone the early part of 2020 he served 165 so that's what they think of him and down here I served some quite early mares to him because I wanted hopefully if we didn't have COVID to show and also if we got a better response than we had uh, we, I want to show a few nice foals at our stallion parade on the 28th of August uh, just gone past but obviously we couldn't do that uh, would I come back by the horse uh, bring the horse back again we had that we bought Perugino down here who was a full brother to Sadler's Wells and uh, this is back in the 90s and he had uh, I think he had Tickle My he had a couple of very good horses in his first uh, first crop and because he wasn't popular either, he wasn't a big horse, typical Northern dancer. And, um, and he basically didn't, so we then brought him back again and we stood at him at 15,000, but it just, the lag time, you've got to be, you've got to bring them back every year, every year. I mean, someone like Equiano, who's actually, that, he'll be probably one which I was disappointed in. Um, you know, I mean, I bought into him every year, had to pay 25% each year he came back. 
and he went from 90, 90 mares because you've got to educate the, the breeding population. If we don't see the horses run down here, our breeding population is very hard. You're pushing, pushing a European or American horse uphill. But once they see the horse, explain to it, they see the foals. Usually the second season is stronger than the first season and the third season is stronger than the, first, uh, the, the, the second season. But then it falls off pretty quickly. I mean, we had, I think we had 96, 110 and 130 max his third year and then he served 25. And of course, that's when I owned, owned the horse, but I wasn't going to bring the horse back because it basically cost me 100 grand each way, one way, uh, 100,000 Australian to, uh, to ship a horse one way down to down or back. Uh, I've got a question here from Peter Stanley. He said, if he's to book his mare to Highland Reel, when's the best time to make an inquiry? And is there a particular month that the booking season starts? Uh, no, you can book any time. Uh, but we usually sort of announce the fees, uh, Peter. Um, we usually announce the fees around about sort of March, April, probably after the sales, um, the, the yearling sales. And really, that's when we know if we've got a new horse on the roster or, or shifting, one, shifting one somewhere else. Or that's, so, so that's really where we do. But always talk to Sam, Sam Matthews about that. But uh, uh, really, it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's, that's the sort of time we do it. Yeah, and, and you do have a few staying pedigrees on your sire list there, Adam, uh, on, on the roster. There's been a fair bit of debate through the Spring Carnival about you know, the lack of staying types in Australia and being bred here. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think that we don't give them enough of a chance? Um, well, we did, we did stand at Murricane. I mean, he was, he, I mean, <laughs> there are disappointments and there are also this one because he was a bit, he was, I mean, with Stalin, just so people know as well, 94, three, 4% of Stalins are not commercially successful. So what happens is you've got to send a lot of you send a lot of mares to be stallions, and so do the owners. The first three years, then they sell them uh, as yearlings, and then they've got a race. So really, you you bank yourself out. And if a stallion doesn't work, then you are actually holding. You're looking out, going into the paddock, and you're seeing not only progeny as yearlings as, uh, and as foals, but sometimes in, the, in in utero of a stallion who actually commercially isn't that good. So really, you, you, uh, you, <laughs> your first cut's the best cut, and it's best just to sell sell those mares because your stallion has basically polluted sadly the brood mare and um, going from there uh the question you said about staying races it's uh, it's 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 a long 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 old question that one and i'll do it another time <laughs> uh and i've got a final question here uh from daniel guthrie and it's quite an important one so what's the biggest fish that you've caught fly fishing and he wants to know the real size of it <laughs> Uh, good on you, Daniel. Uh, do you know it was uh, funny enough from River Y in uh, in Wales, and uh, it was uh, yeah I was 17, 16, 17 years old, and it was a 23 pound hen salmon, and um, yeah it served my brother's 21st birthday with a few smokes, few slices of smoked salmon, but caught the bug there. But uh, love it, and uh, you know it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a great great sport. And uh, but like anything, it gets like your first winner. You have to be very patient to get your first fish. All right, and we'll wrap it up there because we've gone over our hour. hour but I, I think I'd speak for everyone here, Adam. It's been a pleasure, and uh, we've learnt a lot. And we could probably keep chatting for another couple of hours, um, but we will wrap up. We thank you for your time. That's been uh, really intriguing and. Uh, really a wealth of knowledge uh so from the parties when you're 18 all the way through to now being one of the <laughs> main breeders in australia so thanks again for your time and we really appreciate it no my pleasure Corey, and thank you for everybody for listening in and watching in so good luck and i look forward to following all the rest of your shows because i think they're wonderful and you know that's certainly that one which you did with uh with uh, Robbie and uh, and Matt uh, uh, de Kock, I thought it was brilliant. And Malua, you know, Troy's always a true professional. And I know you 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 actually have a little bit of before we wrap up. You do have a little bit of a background with the South African uh, race industry as well, of course. So you did mention that on the phone earlier. Yeah, no, Dad. Dad raced a lot of horses down in South Africa. And funny enough, the first horse I ever bought into the world when I was. Uh, 
uh, Cambridge stud uh, in 1984. It was four. It was two o'clock in the morning on the second of November, and four in the morning, second November. Brought fold down with Russell uh, Russell Warwick and Alex after Westbury, and Shane Keating and uh, Gary Mudgeway. Fold down Marauding, who won the Golden Slipper in 1987, and also both owned my, my father, well, owned by my father and the family, and a black colt with four white socks, which called Capstad, and I leased it off my father, and he won the SARS produce, and uh, I named him after Cape Town in, in Afrikaans, because I then went to Cape Town and worked for Terence Millard, which was like the, the Hayes family, down in, uh, in Milnerton, opposite, opposite, um, opposite Cape Town. And he trained Terence Millard, and he had enormous success, enormous. I mean, won all the Group 1s, Durban Julys, the whole lot. And he trained on the sand, on the beach, on the dunes. And one of my jobs was being on the tractor to, to basically to, to, to make sure that those, uh, all the divots had been taken out of the dunes. So this, this, this uh, training on the, on the sand, which uh, O'Brien's and Weir and, and all those guys do, is absolutely spot on. Uh, and I think it's great. But my father did have great success down there. While I was down there, because after my time at Cambridge Stud, I went down there. I mean, he won the, the Derby with Rutland Arms and he won the Durban July with a horse called Turncoat. So we had a lot of success. Dad had loved South Africa, had some great friends. And De Kock is a, you know, it's a great family. Fantastic. We'll let you go, Adam, because like I said, I reckon I could ask a million more questions <laughs> and we'll catch up at another time and uh, have a glass of wine and, and, and hopefully watch, watch some winners. Maybe one of the horses you've got with Robbie and Matt, we can see that those guys win um, sometime soon when we're allowed back to the races. So thanks once again. Appreciate it. No, my pleasure. Thank you, guys. Take it easy. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much.